They say two heads are better than one, so what about two billion? Today's topic is hive minds and networked intelligence, and I should start by saying they are not entirely the same thing. Indeed, while hive minds is mostly a subcategory of networked intelligence, it has a lot of subcategories of its own too. Probably the best known example of a hive mind from fiction is the Borg from Star Trek, and those fellows are sufficiently horrifying that it gives hive minds a pretty bad reputation. To be fair though, they are rarely presented in a positive light in fiction. We'll try to look at some positive aspects and examples today, but to be honest I think I'd rather jump off a cliff than be part of most versions of them, so I'm probably not a neutral spokesman. Networked intelligence is another story, as a broad category, and networked intelligence itself is one of the three types of intelligence and possible paths to superintelligence we've discussed. One of the others is speed intelligence, when the mind is the same except sped up. That is simple enough and we've talked about it extensively in other episodes. Networked intelligence and quality intelligence, which is rather hard to define beyond the difference between a lone genius who solves a problem a room full of experts could not, are both types we've spent less time on and today we'll fix that for the former. The first key thing though about networked intelligence is that it's already something we have. And I don't mean in the way humans themselves are arguably a colony organism composed of many different types of cells and organs. Unlike the most integrated forms of hive mind, you are not a bigger intelligence composed of smaller intelligences, so I think we have to exclude individual humans as an example of a hive mind. Defining a networked intelligence is a bit tricky in order to avoid trivial examples like a horde of animals with limited communication. Normally with futuristic concepts I always encourage folks to avoid definitions that would include ourselves since that tends to indicate the definition is bad. You and I are not cyborgs. It's nice to point out how things like our glasses or tooth fillings or similar can be argued to be a mechanical augmentation of a human, but it's clearly not what we mean by cyborg so you probably have a bad definition if it includes modern humans. Similarly, humans are not what we mean when we say networked intelligence or hive mind but human civilization was built by us becoming a simple networked intelligence. Moreover, we recognize such things exist, and it's implicit whenever we refer to a group or organization that are beyond classic family and genetic groupings. This company, that sports team, that church or village or city or country, we do regard as an entity in its own right. A network being a bunch of ropes tied together to create a net, usually with nodes or knots, it's probably not too surprising the definition of network is pretty hazy too. But for today's context we'll say the simplest thinking network would be several individual nodes, human minds in this case, connected together exchanging information. Clearly we've been doing this since before there were humans, since even the most basic of body language and noises inside some pack of animals is an intentional exchange of information. If you want to stretch the point, you can argue that even two simple organisms exchanging DNA to make a new one is pretty sophisticated communication, and you can really stretch the point and include even a simple unicellular organism that reproduces by mitosis, by dividing itself, arguing it is a giant factory or many interdependent machines. It's easy to forget just how complex such bacteria are, but it is better to think of them as giant metropolises full of molecules as people and buildings than some tiny simple organism barely bigger than an atom, after all, each cell usually contains trillions of atoms. Like I said though, we have to beware definitions of new concepts so broad as to be meaningless, not because it is inaccurate, just inconvenient and not helpful. I will just place the simplest of networked intelligences at the invention of language, as that seriously jumped up both the bandwidth and integrity of those signals, and as a byproduct allowed far more short-term and focused specialization. We see limited specialization in almost any group of cooperating animals, and we see intense specialization in things like insect hives, But the sheer amount of fast and accurate data that can be exchanged through human language allows us to train people with identical DNA to perform very specific tasks not strongly shaped by their biology, and we see that strongly with the emergence of cities, from which we get the word civilization in the first place. 
Very many people each specialized in very different tasks which could not possibly allow their survival in isolation, just doing that specialized task, all grouped together for fast exchange of information and supplies. Any definition being a bit arbitrary, I will set this as the simplest example of networked intelligence for humans. It also represents a huge paradigm shift and increase in resources and abilities. Same as basic communication and tool use made humans jump up over other animals, the rise of cities and civilizations gave a huge edge. We have tons of technological improvements that make individual people more effective, we've had many more that just let us increase how many people we can have alive and healthy, our carrying capacity. However, many of these inventions were such boons because they improved the network. Roads and bridges to connect rural areas to cities and cities to other cities, carrying not just food and supplies, but allowing the movement of people, ideas, and information. Ships, railroads, highways, postal systems, radios, telephones, and these days the internet, all can be viewed as an amplification and augmentation of basic human speech, which allowed two people fairly near each other to exchange complex concepts quickly and accurately. Even the invention of writing, which allowed communication not only over distance but over time itself, improved this basic human network so that it could include dead people. Long after they were gone, even for memories of the next generation or two who met them and spoke to them, writing allowed us to incorporate non-living humans into the human network and the modern internet has allowed us to include computers and databases into that network too. We don't really think of ourselves as networked intelligence, some actual entity called humanity, but even just those of us old enough to remember when the internet did not exist, and even being exposed to it gradually so it lacked an explosive moment of transition, can see a clear difference in the civilization we have now as opposed to then. Technological changes happen so fast and frequently these days that we are a bit immune to seeing how they changed us, but it has still happened. I wanted to note that though because a bit like cybernetics, networked intelligence is one of those things where it happens gradually enough that we might just keep moving the ball. Folks a few centuries from now might be shot through with tons of devices, cloud storing memories outside their head, and routinely talk to people by just thinking their direction with the technological equivalent of telepathy and still be talking about how in the future people might be cyborgs or network their minds together, not like us of course. But no matter how integrated human minds might get to be, the human itself is not the networked intelligence, it's just a node of it, whether it's an individual or not. Bob is not the networked intelligence of New York City, he's just a component of it. On this subject of networks and hive minds, we are obviously very interested in what happens to the individual, if they still continue to exist or not, or are free or not, or have privacy or not, but the individual is not the network, even if it is a key or irreplaceable component. Who is the network? The network is the network. We have a thought problem that's fairly interesting for developing this notion. We've talked a lot about copying a human mind onto a computer substrate where the processors emulate neurons. That's an intuitive enough concept for folks, but you can just as easily, well not easily, sit millions of people down with pencil and paper and have them perform all those same calculations that computer is doing, storing each result on paper and walking over to hand each new bit to another calculator. We can envision your neurons doing this to make you. We can envision computer chips doing this to make you, but there is something passing strange about the idea of a ton of people cranking all the calculations out manually, including folks looking at the scenery and jotting down data to be sent to a giant skyscraper full of cubicles manned by the team that makes up your eyes and optic nerve. Yet by the same logic as the neurons or the computer emulation, that would be you, and in this case you would be a networked intelligence. All those people are your nodes. You don't, as with the traditional hive mind, have access to their thoughts. You can't control them, they are not indeed wired into your mind at all. We could also replace them with a giant ant colony, a literal hive, that wasn't calculating but performed those operations far more stupidly and simply, pushing colored or centered grains around to serve as your bits and signals. 
I like this example where people or ants, our usual example of a hive mind, are cranking out calculations to run your mind because it both shakes up the notion of thinking of an uploaded mind on a computer as essentially just a substitute brain, a black box doing the work, and highlights that such a thing doesn't actually have to be composed of the actual minds of its nodes in an intrusive manner. I think it is also easier to picture some place like New York City or Tokyo as a potential real separate entity with thoughts when you've just tried to wrap your head around a million people with pencil and paper running your mind. I don't think I would ever categorize one of these as a true networked intelligence unless the mind being generated was actually smarter than the individual components each were, at least at some tasks. And while some group of people working on a problem together might come up with ideas faster and better than an individual could, and maybe even ones no individual would have thought of, it's not really exhibiting much intelligence itself. Of course in fiction it often is because its individual members have usually become drooling morons. At best one can justify this with the assumption that collective mind is using every spare bit of processing power up to and including the bits that process stuff like optical signals so that people can walk right by the drones without even being seen maybe, but this is mostly just bad writing. Or very good writing. In the case of Star Trek's Borg, the writers are presumably more focused on making them a dreadful, inhuman enemy that dehumanizes people, and nothing better shows that than folks stumbling around without apparent self-awareness like a zombie. So I won't knock the Vitos from a story standpoint, just a logical and science standpoint. The Borg are idiots, individually and collectively, and I doubt that demonstrates an actual hive mind properly even if I love them as villains. I think I preferred Unity, a parody of the Borg from the cartoon Rick and Morty, where the titular character Rick gets the hive mind Unity drunk and it comments how it probably shouldn't be trying to run 200,000 pediatric hospitals and 12 million deep fryers in that state. And it's a key point about such hive minds, that if you're composed of lots of individual components designed for doing such things on their own, you probably shouldn't be running them. Humans not only have components of ourselves we control subconsciously, but plenty of bits that operate with no control whatsoever. I don't need to tell my DNA to unzip and replicate, though it might be handy to be able to tell it when to do that and when not to. Indeed we do have some regulation methods inside the body, and cancer can result when that breaks down. I'd imagine a hive mind could develop the equivalent of cancer. And if it layers up a lot of minds, some minds that supervise this or that, it would have to worry not just about individual members leaving or attacking if they did, but also some minds, smaller hive minds, rebelling or breaking away. Obviously the more autonomy you have at the lower levels, the more of an issue that would be. My kidneys have never tried to declare independence or stage a revolt. Hive minds though could easily end up undergoing such breakaways or mitosis as a form of reproduction. In the absence of instantaneous communication it might need to as well. I mentioned a few episodes back in Digital Death that a human brain spread out to the size of a planet, but with its signals switched over to light speed ones, would process at the same rate as a normal human mind. Spread out beyond that and you'll either need some form of FTL communication, or you will start suffering time lag issues. So spreading a hive mind over multiple planets, let alone solar systems, would seem a serious limitation. I tend to be skeptical about us ever inventing any form of FTL, but even if we grant it for the moment, a lot of fictional and theoretical FTL methods are simply faster than light, not instantaneous, or have some serious bandwidth issues. You can probably run an interstellar empire on dial-up modem speeds, the old Battletech and Mechwarrior franchise did that, but I can't see running a hive mind that way. This is one possible Fermi Paradox solution that gets kicked around too that aliens don't spread out from their homeworld much because they converge to being hive minds, or get replaced by singular entities like a super-intelligent, planet-sprawling computer. I tend not to bring up in Fermi Paradox discussions because it's not a good one, but it is of interest today. It's not a good one because you can't assume every civilization does this, you can't assume none would be willing to subdivide to found a new small hive mind in another system and it still suffers from the Dyson Dilemma, in that you can build Dyson Swarms around your own home star, and as we saw in the Mega Earths episode, you can't just keep building those up with resources brought in from elsewhere until it is galactic mass and hovering just above the critical density to turn into a black hole, either as a borch planet or a truly huge Dyson Swarm of Dyson Swarms. 
I think most hive minds would be willing to reproduce by making a new one elsewhere, but they might not like the idea of essentially making a rival, and for that matter they might need a certain minimum number of people just to make existence bearable for those colony splinters. In Kevin J. Anderson's Saga of the Seven Sons, you've got a limited hive mind, the Eldirans, who tend to need to do everything big, including their defense fleets, just to have enough of them in one place to stay effective and sane. The Geth from the Mass Effect franchise had that issue too. If that was hard to overcome, you'd probably need to bring resources back rather than expand. Now there's the question of who would go out and retrieve those resources from around the galaxy, but any hive mind that can't design an automated mining vessel obviously came out a loser on that deal when it became one. It's the same issue with folks living in virtual realities. They might not want to abandon their paradise to go harvest resources far away, but they shouldn't have to. If you can make simulated paradises, it implies you can make something smart enough to decently mimic people to talk with in that paradise so programming a ship to go gather stuff and bring it back ought to be child's play, and one would tend to think a hive mind could do it too, especially since they presumably had to be pretty good with intelligence and computers to make their hive mind in the first place. That skips those that naturally evolved, who are often shown as being awful with computers because they never developed them. We get that with Morning Light Mountain in Peter Hampton's Commonwealth Saga, and with the Buggles or Formics in Endor's Game, and lots of other insect hive examples. The former, Morning Light Mountain, cannot naturally speak faster than light, as most of the fictional examples can, so it does have a decent head for electronics and cybernetics, but still never developed computers much. In Endo's game the Buggles do have instant communication and telepathy they naturally evolved, indeed humans back-engineered their own interstellar communication off this. Sort of. They knew it could be done since they could tell by watching Buggle ships react to things faster than the speed of light should have permitted them to witness it, and knowing it could be done, humanity then figured it out. It is implied they need a queen reasonably nearby for this to work though, as a sort of central node, though in later books it is stressed that the queen's body is just one more drone to her, albeit a critical one, and that she isn't really the queen or maybe even the hive but more like our example earlier where your intelligence was run by ants. We also get a retcon about the individual buggers actually having intelligence of their own. Orson Scott Card is pretty good about consistent canon by and large, but some explanations changed over the series, tweaked for consistency I assume. I remember when I did the Stupid Aliens episode and mentioned the book I irritated some folks discussing the buggles, that's not what it was in the book, and kept having to remind folks that it isn't a book, it is a series of around 20 novels and short stories written over 30 years, and that they weren't saying I was wrong, they were saying the author was. Always a problem in science fiction when stuff needs retconning, or maybe didn't but got it anyway, and a lot of folks were irritated when Alice Krieg showed up in Star Trek First Contact, the film not the episode, as the Borg Queen, but it didn't bother me too much personally. The Borg originally spoke with one voice out of a thousand mouths, cold and alien and unified, like a sociopathic chorus, so having a single queen talking seemed wrong. But to be fair, the Borg originally were going to be an insectoid hive race, but they didn't have the budget, so we get the black leather body horror look that seems like something out of Clive Barker's Hellraiser franchise. So changes happen, and it gave the audience a central focus for the villain. There's also no reason a hive can't have a mouthpiece. It's actually inefficient to have a thousand people saying the exact same thing, and a hive doesn't have to be homogenous with every member having the same function and status. Insect hives aren't like that after all, it could be a meat puppet to use as a collective voice, or even a semi-independent system. Now the Borg are horrifying in their own right, but the usual thing that bugs people about them is that membership tends not to be optional. Even in Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, the rather benevolent hive mind of Gaia, which still has modest individuality for its members, is plotting galactic takeover and by conscription not volunteers. It was not a popular move with most fans either, myself included, and is often guessed as the reason why all future books in the series were set before the incident. Nonetheless, there are tons of examples of good hive minds in science fiction, especially when telepathy seemed to be an omnipresent feature even in hard science fiction novels, a trend I'm glad finally died off in the last couple decades, but common or not, rarely do I hear folks speaking of them with enthusiasm. Pretty much the only member of a hive mind in fiction I like is Neville Clavain from the Revelation Space series, 
It probably helps he's a viewpoint character who joins semi-voluntarily, never upgrades his implants from the earlier versions that were less connected, and is often on bad terms with his own faction, the Conjoiners, so he doesn't exactly cheerlead for them. They also don't indiscriminately spread and assimilate folks involuntarily either. Interestingly, Clavain's faction in the books is often in conflict with the other faction of humanity that is closest to being a hive mind too, the Demarchus. They are more of a bunch of intelligences who are networked, so to speak, as like most people they have a ton of mental implants but one of theirs, and the key one for their specific civilization, is one that tries to go straight democracy, no representatives, by having everyone vote on almost everything. Sort of like if every bill in Congress got text message to you for a vote, only as best as I can tell the implants allow them to do it mostly subconsciously and even asleep. I assume the implants in everyone's head know them individually well enough to guess how they'd respond. Forgetting the specific mechanics, that is kind of the ideal of most versions of democracy and its parallels. Everyone gets a say in what happens because everyone has an investment in the outcome and a right to self-determination, so networking folks to make news and details easier to get and absorb to make more informed decisions seems ideal. Obviously taken too far, you get a hive mind where nobody gets any say in anything because there's no individuality left over. The other big issue is the privacy one, and that's a serious issue of the future even when you're not telepathically linked to other people. However, in the networked intelligence case, short of a hive mind, I do think that is just an artifact of telepathy in science fiction. We associate telepathy as reading people's minds, not just the equivalent of a phone or internet connection, so a method using that will understandably make you figure all those minds can read each other and freely look around or even merge. Again, part of why I don't like telepathy in fiction, made up non-science makes for bad extrapolations of the future. Folks end up picturing some mind-eating hive, or a bunch of folks joining hands around a drum circle to meditate and combine their souls. My computer, and thus me, is connected to the internet and to you, obviously, or you couldn't hear me now. I've never noticed my smartphone trying to merge into my brain, even when I'm holding it next to my head, or my computer trying to eat my neighbors. I can read my files from other computers in my house or on a network but only the ones I've shared. When you're doing this stuff with mystical telepathy that presumably can't be done or it takes special effort and training. But when you do it with technology you have to understand how it all works, how brains and memory function, to do it in the first place, so segmenting things off or only sharing specific chosen bits is possible from the outset. And if I want people to know what my schedule is, I can make that open just like my Google Calendar, or if I want only my doctor to be able to look at my medical status, I can do that too. So I think, when we're talking about a technological route to a more networked intelligence, we do not necessarily have to discard privacy and individuality to gain the many obvious benefits. You also probably don't have to go the all-in or out option, one size fits all. Living in a city traditionally cuts down privacy a bit, hence many of us prefer the peace and solitude of the country, it doesn't mean we're divorced from civilization. So too, one can presumably set up such a network to allow people variable involvement to fit their tastes, in general and at the moment. Also just like civilization you could enjoy sub-networks, I'm part of humanity and the US and my state of Ohio and my little village and dozens of various related and unrelated social or professional groups, my level of involvement in each varies and I can adjust my commitment. You could have a human overmind with, say, the submind of Ohio, which was both a separate entity and part of the Earth mind at the same time, and how much so might fluctuate, as might its membership, with some joining or leaving and involving themselves to varying degrees. Werner Vinge explores this notion with a race called the Tynes in his classic novel A Fire Upon the Deep, where we see small group minds of often just a few critters that often switch members who are not really individuals on their own. There are a lot of options for this in fiction, but I would tend to guess people who predict this as an eventuality for humans are semi-correct. Just my guess, but the error being made is that folks don't want to give up their privacy and individuality and must eventually mature to be okay with that, and I personally don't see that as more mature or necessary, that you have to sacrifice privacy or individuality to enjoy the benefits of a greater degree of networking and group cooperation though I could easily see a lot of folks choosing that route, 
and so long as admission is voluntary, more power to them. Obviously if you're too interdependent, it makes it hard to get out there and settle the galaxy, and we'll be looking at a first step to that next week in colonizing the Oort Cloud, which contains tons of potential places for us to colonize, but usually so far apart, even compared to planets, that no unified hive mind would be viable. The week after that, we'll leave the solar system and continue to explore the problems with unification, especially with light speed limitations, in interstellar empires, and then we'll finish out 2017 by heading out of the galaxy and asking if it is even possible to set other galaxies in a universe without faster than light travel. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button, and if you enjoyed this episode you can help support future ones by becoming a channel patron on Patreon. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.